In this presentation, we're going to look at Gregor Mendel, an Augustan monk who uh, lived in a, in a monastery in, a, in an area now known as Bruno in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, he, his work was very, very important in uh, understanding the principles of inheritance and the now called Mendel's Laws. He is termed the father of genetics. Now, he did all his work working with edible pea plants, and they had another, a number of uh, characteristics which he looked at. One of these was seed shape, and he looked at uh, the alternatives of smooth seed shape, and the other one was a wrinkled seed shape. Some other characteristics we're just going to go through. So seed colour. So the seeds were either yellow, or they may have been green. So the pea plant had two variances in colour. Pod shape. So this is the where the actual beans uh, grow. So the pod shapes were either normal, or the other variation of pod shape was that they were constricted. And we can see in this diagram that we can see that they're constricted around the individual uh, beans. Pod colour. So we had a green pod colour. Or alternatively, there was a yellow pod colour. It was these characteristics which he which he looked at, and they were very observable, and that was the important thing about the characteristics that he chose. Next, we're going to look at the flower and pod position. Now, the flower and pod position, as we can see in this diagram, as it's been drawn, we can see the flowers towards the base of the stem, or along the stem, and this is what we call axial. Or alternatively, the flowers and the pods are at the top of the stem, and this is what we call terminal. Now, stem length is the final thing we're going to look at, and this is going to be one of our examples. It's very easy to observe the differences in stem length. So we either have the tall stem length, or alternatively, the other variation was a short stem length, or sometimes referred to as dwarf length. So Mendel's experiments, what did he actually do? So it was very important that he looked at these characteristics one at a time. So he did thousands of uh, crosses one at a time. And to uh, do that, he first of all, he made pure breeding lines. So he was only looking at, say, tall or short. So he made pure breeding lines of tall, and he manually transferred the pollen from the anther to the stigma of the same plant. So the anther contains the pollen, which is the male part, and the stigma contains the egg or it is the entrance to, to the egg. So we can see that being drawn in. So he manually did that. This is termed the P1 generation. After he knew he had pure breeding lines, so pure breeding tall and pure breeding short, and he did this by continually crossing them until all of them were tall. So he'd take out any undesirable characteristics. So once he did that, he crossed a pure breeding tall with a pure breeding short. So this is what we call uh, creating hybrids. So hybrids were crossing pure breeding of the contrasting uh, stem uh, sizes or plant sizes. And we call this the first filial or the F1 generation. After that, he crossed the F1 generation, so the hybrids. Now, he either did this by self-pollinating them because they were hybrids themselves. They were no longer pure breeding. They were hybrids. He, he, uh, he either self-pollinated them or he cross-pollinated them. So when we cross the F1 generation with itself, we call it the second filial or the F2 generation. Now, finally, he did this time and time again. And he did it for the, each characteristic independent of each other. He didn't want to mix up any of them. So good experiment, experimental technique that he controlled his experiment by only changing one variable. And we can see in this diagram that we can see there's multiple crosses of plant uh, size.
the importance of the in crossing and doing multiple times is important for what we call repetition. He repeated it multiple times and he pre uh, precisely recorded all, uh, all the outcomes and made ratios of these outcomes. So what were the outcomes of monohybrid crosses? So let's look at it again. So the P1 generation, we can see again that we're crossing a purebred tall plant and Mendel crossed it with a purebred short plant. So we're only looking at the height of the plant. We're not looking at any of those other characteristics from the beginning. So what we found once we crossed them, that the F1 generation, the offspring, were all tall. And we can see that the, this has been drawn right now. For the F1 generation, all the plants were tall. The significance of drawing four of them will be um, will be explained later. So these are this monohybrid cross where we're studying one trait, so one trait only. So in the F1 generation, we see there's only one characteristic, and that is that all the plants are tall. So we know that the dominant trait, the trait that is always seen, is the tall one. So when a tall purebred is mixed with a short purebred, all of them are tall, and tall is dominant over short. As we saw before in the F1 generation, he crossed two hybrids. So these crosses are either done by self-pollination or they're done by cross-pollination. So he crossed two hybrids. We found out that on these crosses, because he's crossing hybrids, we still see that there is a, an overemphasis on the dominant trait, and this is the tall plant. However, one out of the four of them is a short plant. So in the background there, there must be still these, these factors, still these characteristics hiding behind. So the hybrids of F1 crossed, the F2 produces a dominant trait in a 3 to 1 ratio. One plant showed the masked trait, and that was the small one. And we term the, 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 the short one a recessive trait. So dominant is tall, recessive is short. So how did he explain these results? So one of the things he found out was that each characteristic was controlled by a pair of factors. Now we now call factors genes. Back then, Mendel didn't understand anything about genetics, so he called it uh, factors. So an example for this would be we're looking at height and the factors that are tall or short. So factors are passed to the next generation, is the next thing he said, and they're unmodified. So they pass in the next generation in set ratios. They also found that individuals have two factors for each characteristic. So they can be either purebred, so they were both, both tall factors, or they could be hybrid, both a tall and short, or they could be purebred with two shorts. He called the trait that was expressed the dominant trait, and the one that was masked or hidden was called the recessive trait. Next thing is this idea of segregation. He found that factors for a trait segregate during gamete formation. So gametes are the sex cells, so the sperm or the egg, or the pollen in this case, and they separate into different gametes. Now different traits separate independently. We're only looking at one, but height will separate independently of seed shape or seed colour. They're not influenced by each other. And he called this the principles of inheritance, and they became known as Mendel's laws. So, a good experimental technique. Now, without good experimental technique, he wouldn't have got the, the results that he, he was able to achieve. So, the things he did for good experimental technique was he, the use of the pea plant was primarily very good 
technique. This was because they were easily obtained. Pea plants were easy to get. And they were very easy to grow, importantly. And they produced new generations very, very quickly. Rather than waiting for a long time to observe changes, these things could be observed over short periods of time. And you could identify the traits very easily. So tall and short could be identified very easily. It could control the breeding, and we're going to look at that in a second, very well. This is how we controlled the experiment, so we controlled the variables. He used easily observable traits, as we said before, so tall and short, seed colour. He used repetition, the large quantities, large number of crosses. And he looked at all of those crosses separately from each other. He used mathematics. We've already seen that he used mathematics, statistics and, and uh, ratios to work out uh, what's happening over these large amounts of times. And he was able to draw valid conclusions from it. And the plants were easily grown. Now, I was able to control the fertilisation process. And this is very good in terms of controlling the experiment. So purebred lines were produced to start with. And he did this by self-pollination and isolation. And he isolated them in, uh, in enclosures. He then cross-pollinated for the F1 generation using manual transfer of the pollen. He removed the anther. And we can see a diagram of what, uh, what it means to remove the anther. And this was important. Once he had cross-pollinated, he didn't want the, the pollen to, uh, to uh, self-pollinate. So he removed those anthers so that it couldn't self-pollinate itself. So this has showed good experimental technique and good controlling of the experiment. So how did, how did he explain these monohybrid crosses? So we're going to go back through the cross again and this time we're going to use some letters to, uh, to describe the factors. So we know that for each uh, characteristic there are two factors. So we're looking at plant height. We know that a purebred tall one still has two factors, and a purebred short one will have two factors. So we're going to use some letters to identify these factors rather than drawing each time. So for the purebred tall, we're going to use a capital T and a capital T, and for purebred short, a little t and a little t. Now, segregation occurs here. This is this idea that for the sex cells to form, so that uh, the pollen and the egg, they need to segregate. The gametes have to have less genetic information. And they're segregated just like this. So their gametes would have been a, a capital T, a capital T, a little t, or a little t. It's through fertilisation of the gametes that uh, the factors come back together. So one factor is inherited from each of the parents. So how does this work out in the F1 generation? We're going to do a small cross to show how it works out. So we can see that the capital T is crossed with a little t. And capital T again is crossed with a little t. The second capital T from the tall plane is crossed with a little t. And the second capital T is crossed with the last lowercase t. So what it produces is four plants that all have capital T. So they are all tall and they're what we call hybrid tall because they all have a little t there as well. So the capital T represents the dominant factor, i.e. it's tall. The lowercase t represents the recessive factor. So we can't see it, it's masked in this first generation cross, but it's still there hiding in the background. So Mendel's explain this, that each of them have two factors, and that one will be dominant, one will be recessive, and the dominant one will mask the recessive one. So again, we're going to look at an F1 into an F2 cross. So first of all, they have to segregate. So segregation to make gametes. So our gametes will be 
capital T and a little t, and a capital T and a little t. Next we'll look at fertilisation. We're going to do the same cross again. So these are predicted outcomes. Remember when we pollinate things there's going to be many, many more outcomes. So these are the predicted outcomes. So the first cross from one parent to the next, we see capital T, capital T, which is a purebred tall plant. Second one is capital T, little t, which again is a, a hybrid tall plant. Third cross is a capital T, little t, which is a hybrid plant. And interestingly here, we see a little t and a little t. So what we've seen is the re-emergence of the recessive trait. The outcomes of the F2 generation is a 3 to 1 ratio, where three of them are tall and one of them is short. So even though that only one of them is pure breeding tall, the other two are also tall. And very importantly, for the recessive trait to be observed, both factors have to be for the recessive, and we can see that there. So both are the recessive, so the plant is short. So finally, we're going to look at uh, the response to Mendel's, uh, Mendel's work. So first thing we, we, we know is that his work was too progressive for the time. And it was too progressive, one, because he used mathematics, and two, also because people didn't know anything about genes or DNA or anything like that. He only presented his work to a small group of scientists in his, uh, in his hometown. So it wouldn't have got out there and the, the scientific community may not have uh, even understood or, or seen his work. They might not have understood the significance of his work. People believed in blending. So if you cross a tall and a short, you get a middle-sized one. They didn't have an understanding of uh, dominant and recessive. So the use of mathematics and statistics was something that wasn't, uh, wasn't done. It was unusual. And it was poorly understood that he could use mathematics and statistics over large numbers of trials to get a, um, get a reliable answer. And as a monk, he, he had no um, established recognition as a scientist. He wasn't, uh, didn't have a reputation as a scientist, therefore people were less likely to uh, understand or even take serious note of his work.